From Deloitte's AI Institute, this is AI Ignition. A monthly chat about the human side of artificial intelligence with your host, Bina Amanov. We'll take a deep dive into the past, present, and future of AI, machine learning, neural networks, and other cutting edge technologies. Here's your host, Bina. Hello, my name is Bina Amanath, and I'm the executive director for Deloitte AI Institute. And today on AI Ignition, we have Rosalind Picard Ross, a professor, author, and inventor. Ross is the founder and director of the Effective Computing Research Group at the MIT Media Lab, as well as a co-founder of two companies, Effectiva Inc. and Empatica Inc. So Ross, welcome to the show. How have you been? I'm doing well, Bina. Thank you so much. How are you doing? I'm doing well and I'm so glad I'm vaccinated. So I'm looking forward to getting out there and, you know, meeting people in real. So someday, you know, we might actually meet in person soon. I'm very excited about that. Roz, you know, I really wanted to start our discussion with a field that you created, effective computing. I mean, you, uh, the research group that you are the founder and director of to advance human well-being via emotion AI. That's a fascinating area. And can you share a little bit more about what is emotion AI and why is it important? And how do, what does effective computing mean? Yes, thanks. The First, let me start with affective computing. When I framed the area of affective computing, I was referring to all computing that relates to, arises from, or deliberately influences human emotion. And so that's a bit bigger than AI, but it has a huge intersection with AI. Uh, so, for example, affective computing also includes uh, technology that might help better measure and uh, communicate human emotion, whether or not it involves emotional intelligence or uh, machine learning directly in the system. That said, a lot of affective computing does involve machine learning and what has come to be called AI these days. Uh, so if you look at the big circle of affective computing and the big circle of AI, there's a significant intersection. And that area has been named by my co-founder of Affectiva as Emotion AI. Now, in that intersection between affective computing and AI is really the use of machine learning to help people better understand and communicate emotional information. Ross, that's fascinating. Can you share some real world examples of emotion AI and effective computing? Yes, one of the clearest ones for most people is to imagine a future social robot interacting with their customers, perhaps greeting them when they come into a public space. And a social robot is gonna have cameras. And when people interact with it, they're going to expect that that social robot will share their smile if they smile at it, or if they look like an angry customer, that that robot will stop smiling and uh, look more muted and become very polite, possibly submissive, and offering of help to that customer. That ability to see the difference between a happy customer and an unhappy customer requires a lot of uh, sophisticated machine learning and artificial intelligence. And when that artificial intelligence is used for the understanding and communication of emotion, uh, that's an example of emotion AI. Yeah, and would you say emotion AI is primarily driven by facial recognition technology, or is it? Or do you use other uh, markers to identify, uh, you know, whether a customer is happy or getting angry? Uh, can you go a little bit deeper into explaining how how does that actually work? It's important to not place too much emphasis on just one channel, where a channel is something like face or voice because you get the most accurate reading of a situation when you combine multiple channels. When you look at the face, the voice, the posture, the gesture, the context, when you put all of that together, like let's just say I told a joke, and then right after the joke, I see you crack a smile, then probably I've amused you, unless maybe it's sort of a mean smile or a grimace, like a bad pun kind of a smile. There are different kinds of smiles, there are different speeds of smiles, there are different contexts in which the same looking smile can mean different things. So it's not as simple as just saying smiling means happy. In fact, 90% of people when they're frustrated in studies we've done in office environments, 90% of the time they'll smile 
even when they're frustrated. Mm -hmm. So you have to be much smarter than just looking for a simple facial expression. That, that's very interesting. And, you know, I, I love uh, the way you explained it, how it's much more robust to look at, you know, all these different metrics. And now there is also, you know, uh, there is also a, a, an app that uh, your team has released called The Guardian. And, you know, I actually downloaded it. And I, I see, you know, how it's being used. You're using uh, the power of uh, gaming to reward and encourage healthy habit formation, right? How does that tie in with effective commuting? Uh, uh, sorry, how does that tie in with effective computing? And uh, also, you know, how, uh, what prompted you to create that? Yes, and again, effective computing involves more than the use of AI for emotion. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Guardians game is an example of a game developed in my group, uh, mainly led by Craig Ferguson and Sarah Taylor, to make it fun to make behavioral changes that people need to make. We have been learning a lot about what promotes good mental health, and in, in really in the sense that we wish the healthcare system was a true healthcare system, not a sick care system. If we had a real healthcare system, it would help keep people healthy. So we've been studying the science of what keeps people healthy, especially when they're subjected to intense pressures, tough work environments, major stressors, uh, unusual shifts in schedules and sleep. All of those factors can take a big toll on mental health. And we're looking at what are the factors that lead people to bounce back versus what are the factors that make people very fragile and likely to decline into bad mental health when they're put in these tough environments. Mm. So we want to figure out how to help people be on the path that bounces back. And to do that, we've been learning a whole lot of behaviors that if you put them in place, we think they foster greater resilience, right? They build you into like a strong oak tree able to handle the storms yeah. versus one of these little weed yeah. trees that goes snap when the bad weather comes. Yeah. Uh, so to yeah. do that, we then have to get you to do these behaviors, right? It's one thing in theory to know what they are, but yeah. everybody who's yeah. successfully uh, fallen off their diet, you know, unsuccessfully dieted, everybody knows how hard it is to actually do what you're supposed to do. So this game yeah. helps you, helps make it fun to do what you choose to do that hopefully is uh, going to help you be more resilient. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think uh, this is so uh, relevant in the times that we're living in today. I mean, at Deloitte, you know, uh, well-being is a big part of uh, how we uh, work within Deloitte. Right. And I've also seen it across different companies. Uh, mental health, well-being are huge topics. Uh, now, is this game available to everybody or is it more uh, still in the beta mode? It is. We have put it on the web for free for everybody. It is not collecting your personal data. It is not trying to sell you ads. It is our free gift to the world during this pandemic to just say, hey, we know it's a hard time out there. We just want to give yeah. something to help people out. Yeah. How, how do you think, uh, you know, beyond this, how, how, what are your thoughts on how can AI and technology help with um, uh, employee well-being and mental health? This is such a great question to hear. And one of the things I love about it is it's focused on how to keep people well, right? Imagine if instead of, you know, 20 to 50% of your employees having to deal with depression or um, anxiety or really bad problems that make their lives miserable, make their families miserable and hurt productivity. Uh, imagine if you could prevent 80 to 90 percent of that. Right. And while we can't prevent all mental health problems, I think the yeah. number one mental health problem of anxiety disorders and the number two mental health problem, and these are global, of depression, uh, I think at least half of those cases and maybe up to 80 percent of them might be completely preventable or at least significantly mitigated to where it's just the occasional, you know, day or two of feeling blah <laughs> or stressed. Yeah. So how do you do that? Yes. Well, there's actually a lot of great science on how to both prevent a lot of these challenges and fix them when they're little bitty problems before they become huge problems. So the science, I think, is there, but the behavior 
the support for the behavior, the awareness that this is real, that it really matters. And it's not just yeah. like what your grandma told you to do, uh, which is really yeah. wise, by the way, uh, that there's now science showing these things. Um, the ability to take these things seriously, I don't see that as prevalent in corporate America yet as it will be. I predict it's going to become highly prevalent. And yeah. just like, you know, people don't smoke in boardrooms anymore, we're going to start yeah. taking better care of our employees' sleep and schedules yeah. and helping them learn how to build smart relationships, which, by the way, not only makes them much better managers and... Mm -hmm. And think of all the time you would save if you didn't have to deal with people problems, right? I mean, how stressful and time consuming those things are. If you could improve people's ability to make relationships and deal with bad emotional stressors, then companies could be a lot more productive and people could go home a lot happier. Their spouses, significant others would be much happier. Their children would be happier. And then they're able to be yeah. more you know, productive and creative and uh, just a lot more effective. Yeah, so true. And, you know, so I am, I would say I'm relatively new to Deloitte. I've been here for almost two years now. And I was pleasantly surprised when, when I joined that Deloitte actually has a C-suite executive focused on well-being, chief well-being officer. And her role is to think about employee well-being, mental health. There are games and there are, you know, there are surveys to just constantly make sure that employees are, are you know thinking about their own wellness and the company is engaged with them right and then when the pandemic hit it actually took it to a whole new level and you're right you know we are seeing more and more companies doing this we're also seeing that uh, you know the broader need around purpose right and whether it is setting up a purpose office like we have but you know bringing in all those uh, impacts of uh, technology beyond value creation, right? The negative impacts that could be happening, whether it is through, wh whether it is about mental health or about uh, climate change and sustainability, how is technology driving that in a bad way? You know, thinking about all these different aspects and, uh, you know, putting more thought into it. Uh, I completely agree with your prediction that we are going to see more and more of these C-suite roles evolving and more focus being put into uh, the area around employee well-being. I, I think um, we, we're definitely seeing that that being accelerated in the past year or so, right? Now, changing uh, gears a little bit, I know you're very uh, passionate about wearable technology and how to leverage that as well. And with your, with your new company, Empatica, you've created the first AI-based smartwatch cleared by FDA to monitor seizures. Can you share a little bit about the work you're doing there and how that uh, is actually um, moving the whole wearable industry forward? Yes, and I'm also excited to say uh, we we recently created also the first smartwatch cleared in the European Union. We're still working on data for FDA that is able to use AI to forecast if that feeling you have tonight, like. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes, you know, when you've been pushing really hard at night, you're just exhausted yeah. and you don't know, like, am I just tired because I'm pushing hard or am I tired because I'm getting sick? And th that difference might cause you to go to bed early if you're getting sick or just stay up and push a little bit more if you've got a deadline tomorrow. Uh, and I've always wondered, like, could I tell? Well, it turns out our wearable data we've been collecting that I've been staring at uh, and I thought I saw something in there that might tell the difference after much yeah. more careful studies, years of careful studies with Duke, Stanford, Columbia, a whole bunch of partners uh, building on work we started at MIT. Well, Empatica has just filed in the European Union for medical clearance to market uh, the AI that can forecast if tomorrow you're going to have a positive viral infection test or a negative test. And it's sensitive and specific enough that it has just been cleared uh, for medical marketing in the European Union. So very exciting. In addition to Empatica having an FDA cleared seizure biomarker, uh, Empatica now has a European Union cleared marker that says, yes, we think you're infected with a viral respiratory infection, or no, you look like you're clear. And it is now validated with uh, a nasal swab gold standard test uh, 
uh, that mm. shows if you're positive for H1N1, rhinovirus, two kinds of influenza, mm. or COVID-19. Now, it doesn't say which one of those you have or that you definitely yes. have influenza or SARS-CoV-2. Uh, however, it says that your body is changing physiologically in a pattern that is highly consistent with having that positive PCR test tomorrow or having a negative PCR test tomorrow. So it helps you discriminate normal fatigue and stress from that heightened immune response that makes you tired and stressed, uh, but means you really better get to bed and actually schedule a PCR tomorrow, stay away from people at risk, maybe schedule to see your doctor, get a real swab and find out you know, if it's one of the flus, you could take something like Tamiflu. Maybe in the future, we'll have other yeah. early interventions for SARS-CoV-2 or other things that cause this immune system response. Uh, so I see it as on the front of medicine that is more preventative, right? In this case, it's not preventing you from getting sick, but it is hopefully preventing you from having significant uh, duration of illness and yeah. preventing you from giving it to somebody else when you may be completely asymptomatic other than the stress and fatigue, which for a lot of Deloitte and other you know, hard pushing workers, stress and fatigue feels like a normal part of existence, right? You, you just yeah. learn to kind of ignore it. And, but if it's actually a sign of your body's immune system fighting something, you don't want to ignore it. You want to, um, you know, protect those around you and uh, get well fast. So Roz, um, you know, changing gears a little bit, moving beyond healthcare, um, how do you see the work that you're doing relevant uh, in different industries? Yeah, I, I know you are a thought leader and I want to also hear, you know, how is AI in general uh, impacting different industries from your perspective? But maybe st let's start with how is effective computing impacting different industries or is it primarily from a customer success area? Yeah. Affective computing is impacting pretty much every industry that involves people. For example, there is a huge impact right now in uh, automotive in looking at the state of the uh, operator of the truck or the car. Uh, is that person stressed, angry, distracted, tired? All of these affective state variables show in more than your face. In fact, sometimes your face can be blank and it will show in other things we can measure from you. And again, in affective computing, traditionally we go into an environment and we look at all the things that might be changing with your affective state. You know, it could be affecting how hard you're squeezing something, uh, the jerkiness of your movement, um, the way that you're shifting in a chair. You know, the face is just one of many things. Uh, we always measure with fully informed consent, talking to people about, you know, uh, opting in, knowing what information you're sharing, and making sure that there's a benefit for them, right? Why should they share this information if they don't yeah. benefit from it, right? So it's a complex equation uh, we work on. And then when that is, uh, when all the variables are okay, and and there's outside external ethics uh, review approval of it before we start a study, then we begin to do measurements. And those measurements have shown huge advantages to supporting drivers in being safer and also even understanding sometimes the state of passengers to improve their experience. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of people are predicting that we might have uh, driverless cars in the future. And I'm uh, maybe a little right. more conservative on that, noticing that, by the way, automatic pilots have been helping fly planes for, guess what, more than 100 years. Uh, but we still have human yeah. pilots there. And I think there's a, other reasons why um, automobiles have a much more complex environment to deal with than uh, than airplanes. Uh, nonetheless, uh, whether it's driven by a human or a human is just a passenger, we all know that there's a lot of stress in vehicles, even in uh, driverless cars. We've uh, measured the stress in some of the very first uh, driverless cars. There's a lot of stress. So we um, can do things to help people. And at the Media Lab, we've been building other technology that goes in the seatbelt or in the ambient um, modulation of the sound in other aspects of the environment that can uh, help you change your breathing rate and have a much more focused and calm experience to the point where we actually have to be careful of the other side, yeah. <laughs> which is we don't want to put you to sleep, right? Yeah. So there's always a sweet spot yeah. here. I, I adjust it. <laughs> I use our technology myself when I'm doing work on, used to be a lot on airplanes and now, you know, even at home. Yeah. 
And, you know, I dial it a certain way to pet me up and another way to calm me down and focus yeah. me. Uh, and it's really cool how these technologies, even without using AI, just taking what we've learned from the AI, uh, can help improve your experience and your productivity. This is a great example. I, I mean, I wouldn't even have thought of, you know, how it might be relevant for a um, driverless cars that that is so re relevant i think we've all latched onto this notion of ai and there's so much hype around it uh, and there is even with just advanced statistics or machine learning there is already so much impact happening and value being created in 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 industries and companies across the world that uh, you, you are seeing significant changes in the workforce for example or in talent right uh, I, I mean, even with this, compared to 10 years ago, you're seeing new roles that have come up, which didn't exist 10 years ago. So do you, uh, what are your thoughts about, you know, some of the jobs that have been created and some of the jobs that will get, continue to get created? I think when it comes to jobs where the success depends yeah. a lot upon human connection, we're going to see humans continue to be in those roles. Uh, perhaps augmented by AI, but not replaced mm -hmm. by AI. Let me let me give an example in healthcare. Yeah. I think the patient nurse interaction is a very special one, and I'll say nurse in a general sense. There are a lot of healthcare professionals that you can encounter uh, besides nurses uh, who can connect with you in a way that can be super important for calming, for reassuring, for giving you a sense of presence that is not replaced by a machine. Now, now let me back up because a moment ago I was saying, hey, I'm building these AIs that can be very calming, right? These technologies yeah. that help with respiration. And we do have those and they are useful. And it might be that a nurse or a person talks to you a little bit and then says, hey, is it okay with you if I leave this on? Maybe this helps calm and reassure you. I think yeah. the technology used with a person is much more valuable than the technology used alone. Um, we have seen this, for example, when the AI presents an empathetic statement to a user in a controlled study where we randomize the, uh, the information the user is given. The user is told, oh, this is coming from a human or the, this is coming yeah. from a chatbot. And even when it's identical comment rated as really highly high quality com content, uh, yeah. when it comes from the chatbot, Humans don't think it's as valuable. They don't think it's as effective. And all we've changed is the source. Just the knowledge that yeah. another human is playing chess with you or another human is there yeah. with you, it makes a difference. And while we might exactly reproduce the, uh, you know, what is said or the appearance or some other information content of that interaction, we cannot replace people with AI. So true. So, uh, you know, the work we do, you know, our fundamental belief is it's about augmented intelligence and humans with machines and, uh, you know, making things better, right? Um, there is, um, uh, I love the way you articulated it. Do you see any new kinds of roles or skill sets that's needed to uh, succeed in the new era that's coming at us as as the machines get smarter or as our uh, software technologies become smarter and can w help augment us better what are the new skill sets in your view that um, uh, that our talent pools should be thinking about I think that more than ever it's important for people to have some basic fluency about what AI can do and also what it hasn't been shown to do. I also think it would be great to have fluency about the kinds of performance measures that AI is measured against. When an AI researcher like me says that something is achieving 98% accuracy, right? You know, this term accuracy, there needs to be some questions given back. Okay, so you're 99% accurate at detecting if a seizure is there, but what is the false alarm rate, right? Like how often does it detect something that it says is a seizure, but it's not? Well, we have that rate down very low now. The false alarm rate uh, when submitted to FDA was less than one every five days. Um, now it's gone even lower, but that's an important question to ask, right? Not just the accuracy, but 
you know, okay, that car was shown to be accurate in this environment under this weather up to 98%, but, you know, you multiply that by a billion drives. <laughs> How many accidents is that? What is the rate when it's yeah. in environments that it hasn't been tested in? What is the rate when it's under road conditions that, you know, that are outside the parameters studied? I think that everybody should feel comfortable asking those kinds of tough questions of the AI researchers, because the limits in the data set imply unknowns about the performance in the real world. And everybody should have that kind of, uh, you know, critical thinking about AI. There's another set of skills that I think everybody is going to need increasingly in the workforce. Yeah. And that, uh, it's funny because some people will sound dismissive of this because they'll say, oh, you know, you know, those are soft skills. Uh, but I'd say if you measure the effect of these soft skills on productivity and people's ability to make those around them successful, you will find that these are uh, super important. And if you look at how hard they are to do, you'll change them from being called soft skills to extremely hard skills. These are hard skills to do. And yeah. these hard skills are the skills of showing empathy. And I don't mean just like feeling sad when somebody else is sad. I mean, making them feel that you understand them. And this is not the same as saying, oh, I understand you're having trouble. Uh, this is different from that. This is really reflecting back to them and understanding of what they're going through in a way that helps them feel understood and get to the next step, which is the ability to solve their problems and move past it. That skill is extremely important. I've seen that skill uh, have lawsuits called off. I have seen that skill make a huge, huge difference in how a project succeeds or fails. It's an incredibly important skill. And a lot of people kind of think they can do it, but they can't. They're not very good at it. It's like me hitting a golf ball. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. I'm not going to go up against the pros. Uh, this is a skill that if you get to be as good as the pros, it will make a difference, not just in your game, but in your workplace. Love it. The, there are, uh, you know, the, and you've touched on it briefly throughout this conversation around, the, uh, you know, thinking about ethics and bias. What, uh, you know, in your viewpoint, where are we, in, you know, all, all about thinking on ethics? Is there, there's obviously a lot of talk on it, but how close are we to solving some of those complex, icky challenges around fairness, bias? transparency, these are all headline catching topics, but how close are we to solving some of it? And how are you addressing it in the companies that you found? It's very exciting to see how the AI community has jumped on the bandwagon of promoting <laughs> transparency, interpretability, fairness, de-biasing data. It has been a very fast response to uh, you know, the red flags that were presented early on uh, for example, by J Joy Bolamani at the Media Lab, showing that uh, some of the face yeah. recognition systems were biased toward white males. They were better performing at them than they were at women and people of yeah. darker skin types. So that kind of uh, bias is there in data sets. And one thing really exciting about the potential to solve it is it's very solvable by getting more representative data sets, you could solve that bias. The machine learning, uh, most of the systems can fix it. There's occasional cases where we've looked at things like a sensor might work differently in terms of the light received against dark skin versus light. Uh, but those things now also are being adjusted and tuned in wearables and, and other systems. So I'm very optimistic that those kinds of biases can be removed. In fact, I'm more optimistic that AI will be unbiased before people <laughs> will be unbiased. Because uh, with people, you can hide it, you can't measure it, it's harder to manage. Uh, with AI, it's measurable, it's manageable. I think it's soon gonna be solved in AI, the biases. Now that said, when it comes to transparency and interpretability, people are still way ahead of AI. It's very hard to do 
really interpretable AI. There's been some super nice progress made with it. Recently, the work of Asma Gandaharian at the MIT Media Lab, yeah. I think really moves things forward significantly. She has shown a new automated way for the algorithms to go in and discover different pathways to the key uh, classification decisions that an AI is making. And the algorithm also synthesizes examples along that pathway. So not only is the algorithm finding these different interpretations, but it's presenting them to people in a way that are interpretable by people. And I think that's a big leap forward in interpretability. Uh, now, it is limited to certain kinds of AIs right now. We need to see if it's going to work yes. for other kinds. And I'm optimistic that it will you know, lead to more work there. Can we prove that it has interpreted all the things it might do wrong? Unfortunately, yes. we still can't prove that. That is still a holy grail. So true. There's also uh, nuances around ethics that we see, you know, across different industries, right? Like, I, I think there's a lot of focus put on bias, fairness and transparency. But there are things like um, the safety and security or uh, uh, reliability of an algorithm, right? Once it's in production, because the reality is that depending on which industry or even within the industry, which use case you're working on, uh, you know, the ethical implications might be different, right? And I give this example of, you know, when you're trying to predict a failure of a machine on a factory floor and you're using just the machine sensor data, there is the fairness and bias just doesn't apply from an ethical part. What applies more is the robustness or the reliability of the model that's being used, right? And then the bigger uh, challenge around how do you drive the cultural change needed to adopt AI. So the nuances of AI in the real world expand a little bit more than um, fairness, bias, transparency. But we also see more um, more appetite for driving that change, right? For thinking about uh, ethics early on and saying, how do we actually put the guardrails in place early on? And I'm so glad, uh, you know, the work that you shared, uh, you know, very familiar with the work Joy has done and with would love to learn more about the work that Asma is doing. You know, do you see, um, you know, especially when, when, you, when you spoke about data representation, right? But a lot of data that we use historically it tends to come biased because humans are biased and our historical data is biased. Do you see a lot of progress happening in terms of using synthetic data to address some of these challenges? There, there are so many things that you bring up that, you know, that we could go deep into. A question that I have just broadly is, you know, there's, you know, the technologies that we're using in the real world is still developing in research groups in academia. You know, there, there's a lot of development still happening while it's beginning to be used in the real world in industries, right? What, in your opinion, what has worked where, you know, to drive that innovation or partnership closer between academia and industry? so that we can tap into research sooner rather than later. How, how has it worked for you? Well, I'm very blessed to be at the MIT Media Lab, where I think yeah. we have one of the most enlightened models of how to work with industry. MIT, for its whole lifetime, has been one of the most heavily engaged with industry of all research universities. And the Media Lab, as a part of MIT, is, is even the heaviest <laughs> engaged part. Yeah. We interact yeah. regularly with industry. We share our ideas openly. We invite them in, uh, well, physically <laughs> when there's no pandemic, yeah. virtually right now, to um, show what we're, what we're creating to get their input. And what tends to happen is a researcher will have, you know, like, oh, I've got like 15, 20 ideas of how this could be used. And then industry comes in and says, well, what about this? Well, could it be used for this? Well, explain this a little yeah. bit more. I don't understand this. And that process leads us to refine our focus on the research on things that can improve the world better, that, that industry really cares about. Industry tends to understand the real problems a lot better than researchers. We tend to be sometimes a little naive about what the world really cares about and a little bit more obsessed with some cool new math or technology that, that we just invented last week. And oh my gosh, look, it works. Like, wow, now yeah. we got to find a use for this. And so by interacting and by really having a comfortable creative environment where people can ask any questions, you know, there's no stupid questions. We can share ideas, get kind of on the same 
uh, page, that leads to amazing innovation. I have seen so many things where we were thinking they should go this way. Industry shows us there's a much better value proposition over here. And so that really early engagement is, I think, uh, really magic for uh, getting technology that is both uh, better for the world and more quickly adopted in the world. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, maybe that goes to the next question, right? Like companies are in different stages of their AI journey. Some are still early on, have done a few POCs, have a couple of AI solutions in production. Some are well advanced in using AI in every aspect of their business. And then there's, uh, you know, the companies that are in the middle. What's your advice to the CEOs and board members of companies that are just beginning, that, that, that are just in the initial phases of their AI journey? If you're just in the beginning of your AI journey, first of all, congratulations for even beginning it because it, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve at the beginning. I would encourage you to not be shy about asking questions and s- testing your understanding. And don't just take some brainy answer of, oh, it's 99% accurate as uh, meaning that it's gonna work in your space. You can uh, hire a machine learning student from a local university, you know, to come in and ask some tough questions about it. Uh, you can learn how to ask tough questions. Get somebody on your team who really takes time to learn the latest stuff and isn't uh, isn't intimidated by the math. Get somebody who understands failure and can communicate uh, that and can uh, have the group touting the great new method, get the kind of data that you actually want to apply the AI to and really test it in that environment. Nothing beats testing the AI on your data in your real use case. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, what's learned in one space yeah. may not generalize to your space. A completely different method may be optimal on your data. In fact, there is theory, pay attention, little quick nugget here, Uh, You'll impress your machine learning people if you've heard of the no free lunch theorem in machine learning, which essentially uh, the super simplified version of it is that no one method is going to be best for all problems. Just because they've shown this method is better than all these other over there, it it may actually be the worst method for your problem. So ultimately, the best method for your problem is the one that works on your data And I mean, not just on one data set, but when it's trained on one data set and tested on one that it hasn't seen yet, it still does really well on that unseen data. What about the companies that are well advanced in their AI journey? What should they be thinking about next? If you're advanced in your AI journey, I would uh, hope that you have not lost sight of how important people are. (laughs) And uh, you may be enamored with some amazing success your AI is making, and that's great. I would ask you to ask the next level, which is if we value the people more than the AI and put these together, can we do something even greater than the AI is doing? Sometimes it's easy to get uh, sucked into the measurable stuff and get all excited about, you know, This system works much better than that one. But then when you take that system and you put it in with a group of people and the people use it, what if their decision making gets worse? Okay, we have actually seen in some studies that the optimized AI plus the human expert, including a medical expert, can actually make a worse decision than either makes alone. All right, we don't want that. (laughs) We want the AI plus human or the final deployed system to do better. And we want to make sure that we've taken care of uh, preventing any catastrophes. And we want to make sure that, you know, that rare but horrible thing uh, that might happen doesn't happen. So you've got to look at these AI systems, not just in a spreadsheet and how accurate they're doing on test data, but in the context with the employees or the people who are using them and look at how accurate the end deployed solution is. Don't stop testing uh, with just the AI. Look at the deployed environment. So true, so true. We, we are also seeing that big need uh, around ML ops or you know, the whole, once it's in production, how do you keep it you know, continuously reliable and n- no new challenges are creeping in? 
Ross, this has been such a great discussion. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, how can people stay in touch with you, follow you with uh, on all the amazing work that you're doing? Can you share? Yes, I can be reached uh, at picard at media.mit.edu. Uh, online, on social media, I'm Rosalind Picard. Smash the two names together on Twitter. I also have a very fledgling Instagram account. I've heard from the students, Instagram is the most stressful social media, so I'm a little late to it. Uh, I'm R.W. Picard on Instagram. And I encourage you to follow the amazing work going on at Empatica. That's the Italian word for empathy, E-M-P-A-T-I-C-A, Empatica.com uh, and their blog as well, where I sometimes guest write. Ross, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really enjoyed our discussion and I, I actually look forward to staying connected. Thank you, Bina. I look forward to staying in touch with you too. And your Deloitte uh, extended family should know we are so grateful to have Deloitte as members of the MIT Media Lab. And yeah. I hope that all Deloitte oh, yeah. employees will, you know, come and visit the MIT Media Lab, engage with us, ask us questions, and let's work together to yes. build that better future that we think we can all build with AI and people, AI plus people together. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Check out our AI Ignition page on the Deloitte AI Institute website for full video and podcast episodes. And tune in next time for more thought-provoking conversations with AI leaders around the world. This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to Deloitte.com backslash about.